I know this jacket's wrinkled, looks old, and looks like it's been sitting at the bottom of a hamper for the last 10 years. I wear this jacket like once every um, few years or so. Let me tell you why I'm wearing it. I wear this jacket because um, tonight because of what I'm talking about this evening. People are just super important to me. Relationships are just a huge deal for me. And, um, and, and so there's people in my life that have spoken in my life a number of different ways. I, I like to read my dad's Bible because I like to, just, there's something about the fact that my dad spent thousands of hours holding on to a Bible, turning pages. I can see the chapters that were most important to him because when he turned the pages, he'd lick his thumb like this and flip the pages. And so the corners that are the most yellowed or the most is his favorite portions, you know. Um, and so, uh, so I can see what those are. But at the same time, there's something, you know, it's, we don't worship stuff and objects and things like that. But there's certain things that connect me to people in my heart. That's just kind of the deal. And um, one of my favorite topics in all of the world is, uh, is church history. I really, really like it a lot in a, in a weird kind of sort of way. I, I, I never go too far without a copy of, of Athanasius's On the Incarnation really, really close to me. I know that probably doesn't mean anything to many of you in here, but it's a, it's a big deal to me. Um, uh, just, just the church fathers, the, and I'm talking about the early church fathers. I'm not talking about people who lived like 100 years ago. I'm talking about the early, early church fathers. They're a huge deal to me. And one of the people that unfolded that, um, that love for me, which I don't really preach a whole lot about, it's not something some of you unpack on a Sunday morning. You've got to wait to a Thursday night crowd because Sunday morning people typically just check the box. I mean, God bless them. We're glad they're here. You know, uh, Sunday night people, they genuinely love, you know, the pastor. But the Thursday night crowd, they love Jesus. That's what I think, at least. I'm just going to go with that. So, so you can talk about stuff to the Thursday night crowd that you can't get away with talking about anywhere else because we can get into the depths of things, you know. So, um, so one of the characters in my life that gave me a genuine love for the church fathers, church history, and, and uh, things like that was a dear brother of mine named Michael Reed. And um, Tracy and I lived next to Michael. Uh, when we first got married, we lived next to Michael and his wife. And he was just a, an old hippie guy from, from uh, California that had migrated out to Texas. And I, I don't ever remember seeing Michael without a smile on his face. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Tracy's nodding too. So, And, uh, uh, and he, he would be sitting out, you know, and his sitting out underneath the, the trees in his back, backyard and he'd have his Bible open and he'd tip his head back and he'd close his eyes and he'd just be enjoying the presence of God and I thought, I want to know God like that. I'd sit down with him. My father was the most instrumental man in introducing me to the Lord, but next to that, um, without a doubt, it was Michael Reed. And it was just the, just the presence of God, just part of him. But he had a tremendous knowledge of the things of Scripture. And so he opened up a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about to you tonight. He, he sparked an interest in me to just read and read and read. And so I, I do so voraciously. And this was Michael's coat. He passed away some years ago. And, and so whenever I really, you know, think about some of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight, I, just, I like to connect to Michael. So this is his jacket. It didn't fit him well either. So... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's the coat. Anyway, uh, I want you to go to, to Psalm 46 tonight. It's going to take us a little while to get there. But before we get there, I, I want to take you on a bit of a tour of history and uh, <clears throat> just kind of land where we're going to land tonight. Uh, I'm going to, to do a disservice to the historical record by just glossing over so many important things. And if you are a student of church history, you're gonna be like, what, you're not gonna talk about the Council of Nicaea in 325? You're not gonna talk about Constantine? They're gonna talk about all, no, 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 I'm not gonna do that. But I just wanna hit a couple of points that are gonna tie everything to where we're gonna go tonight. Um, when, when the church was super young in its infancy, in its first century, uh, you had, eventually you had uh, Peter and Paul both martyred in Rome. And now the apostles, with that, the apostles are gone. They're, 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 uh, John is still around, and he's, uh, he's, he's kind of scaring the church, actually, because we have, we have a, just a handful of writings in the first century. Not much. New Testament's not finished, not complete, won't be done until after the first century. And, uh, and, and John, he's still around. He's the only apostle that's still around, but, you know, it's a little questionable because he's left, he's left something called Revelation of Jesus Christ, which really freaks everybody out and still continues to do so today. 
And so uh, the church doesn't really know what to make of, of its roots in a sense. It's, 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 form, it's, it's, in, it's in diapers, it's in its infancy. And in, um, under, under persecution, the church in Corinth went through a radical split. And the split was essentially a bunch of young leaders that were coming up on, under a bunch of aging leaders decided the aging leaders were no longer relevant and the young leaders went and literally kicked the aging leaders out, told them they were no longer in charge and they assumed authority in the church. Sound familiar? It's been going on for 2,000 years, right? And there was a guy named Clement. And Clement wrote uh, a letter, which you can find online, the letter of Clement. It's one of the first uh, the first early, the earliest Christian writing we have, uh, and this guy was really important because he knew Paul and Peter, so he could speak to their character and he could speak to the desire of their heart. And so Clement writes this famous letter that is really, really brilliant. And what he does, he sends this letter off to Corinth, uh, and, and when he sends the letter to Corinth, he basically rips these young leaders a new one. And he, understand, to him, splitting a church was a horror. I mean, the older leaders were going out and they're starting another group over here. And, 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 and nowadays we've got, we've got you know, Catholics and Protestants and then of the Protestants we have uh, registered in the United States, I mentioned last week, what, over 33,000 different denominations registered with the IRS here in the United States. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. It doesn't speak to our unity very well. It speaks to our division a whole lot. The idea of churches in the same community that actually didn't, that didn't like each other or competed against each other was a horror to Clement. As a matter of fact, in his letter, he goes so far as to say, the church, the people of God, are the body of Christ, and if you divide the body, you do violence to Christ himself. I mean, that's, that's, he, was, he pulled no punches. And he went after this thing, and he basically made a call for unity. And you know what? The young folks, they looked at his letter, and they listened. And they actually reversed the entire decision, brought people back, and there was unity. Not only that, but they copied that letter and sent it out to every church in the known world at the time where any churches were. And literally for hundreds of years within the Christian faith, and of course Catholicism is gonna grow up over the next few centuries, but for, Clement's got no concept of that, but for hundreds of years within the context of the Christian faith, this letter of Clement's is going to be read on Sundays from the pulpit as a call to unity in the church. It does maintain one, oneness, in a sense. The word Catholic, by the way, just means universal. In other words, just one church. So, um, but of course, over the course of time, institutionalization kind of makes things kind of weird and people make up new beliefs and new ideas and weird thoughts that have no basis in scripture start coming out. And, and when you, you know, forbid people from reading the Bible, they can't tell what's really true or what's not. And finally, when Martin Luther shows up in 1517 and does his thing with the Wittenberg uh, door and the 95 Theses on the door, is more legend than anything, but still nonetheless, he made a major point. When he does that, he busts the church wide open. The invention of the printing press makes it possible for everybody to get a copy of the Bible, which Luther goes and, and translates into German. Now we have uh, any person on the street can just get themselves a copy of the scriptures. Never happened before, and because of that, Protestantism blows up and and again, those of you who are historians know that I'm really, really going fast through that. Um, but, but here's the deal. The letter of Clement was lost. Once, of course, Protestantism never got, uh, never got to read the letter of Clement because nobody knew that he even existed, actually. Luther um, bears no mention of it at all. As a matter of fact, he doesn't mind splitting things left and right. Um, there's, there's apparently no knowledge of the letter of Clement in his, in his world, and, and somehow during the course of history, it just, it just gets lost. You, know, you just read a letter for a thousand years, I guess it finally just becomes assumption that everybody automatically knows this. And within a matter of a few generations, the letter just disappears. Until, in 1623, a copy of the letter that happens to be folded up and stuck inside of a Bible, beautiful old Bible, is presented as a gift to the king of England, and in 1623, he reads the letter of Clement, and suddenly the Western world gets this letter all over again, and we get a new call to unity. 
Uh, in the 1600s, actually, uh, there's a, a few people that arise out of the 1600s that are really, really, really important. Brother Lawrence's big name that you may have read, um, is a huge deal. Madame Guyon uh, is a huge deal. Uh, her writings are just unparalleled in, in Christian literature. But there's a guy that I want to draw your attention to that I'm going to probably go out on a limb and say that 99% of those of you sitting in here and, and those of you who have, are, are watching online have probably never heard of, but you should. And his name is Michael Molinos. A brother Lawrence and a Madame Guyon in the 1600s, Michael Molinos was actually more well-known than any, any other Christian thinker in his day. And Molinos wrote a book uh, called The Spiritual Guide, which was lost for many, many years and is now back in print. You can actually get a copy of it on Amazon. Highly encourage you to do so because it's a really cool read. And what Molinos did is, is he had developed a life of contemplation, and he brought people's awareness to two specific things that were really a big deal, the presence of God and the goodness of God, and he came to an awareness of those by taking time just to sit quietly in the presence of the Lord. No practice of liturgy in a sense. In other words, it's not that he had no value for the rituals that we go through and the things that we do and, and all the you know, incense waving and candle lighting of his day. Uh, the stand up, sit down, the kneeling. How many of you grew up Catholic? Okay, a few, so you know what I'm talking about. You stay in good shape, right? I mean, you know, a lot of calisthenics. We get you moving. Yeah, and, and the services in Latin, you know, which if you don't want anybody to know you're preaching on, just preach in a dead language. Sermon prep is super easy. You can preach the same thing every week. So, uh, so Molinos, uh, though, he, he has this strange drawing to more. Like, there's more here. And he starts writing about it. He starts discovering some things about God. He starts just sitting in the presence of the Lord and he has a value for the Holy Spirit. In other words, the present reality of the Holy Spirit. You didn't, back in his day, you didn't sit there and just be like, Holy Spirit, speak to me. You wouldn't ask God to speak to you. The priest did that. The priest could talk to God. The priest was there to forgive your sins as long as you could pony up enough money. But the deal is you didn't have a relationship with God because you didn't know that you could. And Molinos comes along, and of course he knows the scriptures, and on top of that, he's developing a relationship with God, and he gets so excited he wants everybody else to know it too. So he writes the spiritual guide. And it's estimated the Vatican actually puts it out there. I mean, it's a big deal. It's estimated at one time that over 25,000 people across Italy are actually studying, reading his book, and holding home groups, life groups in a sense, in the 1600s, about the spiritual guide. And it's having effect. And then people really start reading into it and studying it. They realize that Molinos believes that God is good, like really good. He believes that God is so good that once you're found, even if you try to be lost, you can't be unfound because God's grip is super tight. He's got you in his hands, and it's an embrace of love, not of control. He gives you freedom, but he never stops being your father. And, ooh, the church doesn't know what to do with some of his teachings. And he's actually branded a heretic. And it's commanded by the church that all of his books be burned. There's more to it than that, but that's essentially the big egregious issue with Molinos. And his books are burned, and he's thrown into jail, into a dungeon, dungeon in fact, where he will die. And, and in, on his tomb, by the way, is Michael Molinos, the great heretic. That's it. Forgotten, left to history, listed with the rest of the heretics. I think it's a great heretic. It's something having to do with heretic, and it's only three words, but it's Michael Molinos branded as a heretic. And, and people forget him goes away. Um, interesting, it's, somebody asked me um, one time, what, what would be, if, if you could like go and search out any artifact 
uh, anything that maybe has been lost to history, what would you want to, you know, find in your lifetime? You know, the, the grail, the holy grail, the cup of Christ or whatever. I mean, who knows if that even exists, right? Um, but I tell you, there's something that does exist that I would love to find and I would love to see it in my lifetime. And it is actually the trial that the church had. And they put people on trial. I mean, the church was the court, jury, judge, executioner. And the, the church tried Michael Molinos and the transcript of his trial was sealed it's under lock and key in the Vatican to this day and nobody has seen it nobody will let you see it and I would love I have no idea there must be something in it that's interesting so I would love to see I would love to see the transcript of the trial of Michael Molinos someday so um, I want to set up Psalm 46 by going through Molinos' four-step path of personal understanding of how he came to this revelation of the goodness of God. He wrote of four aspects of what he called the journey into love. How many of you say in your lifetime you've fallen in love before? Yeah. It's interesting because it sounds really violent, doesn't it? Falling, you know, a fall is like an accident right? Um, and, and then there's, there's books about loving on purpose. There's books about like love, you know, love being uh, an action. Love is something you do. I think Dobson wrote a book, something about that. I can't remember the name of it, but you know, it, the, the idea that, that love is a choice. That's it. Love is a choice. It's a choice you make, you know. Um, but if you've ever been in a moment where suddenly you felt like you were taken over in the presence of the Lord, and you suddenly had an awareness of the love of God, that you, that you didn't suddenly just choose, well, I'm gonna choose to love the Lord today. Maybe suddenly you're just standing there in a service, worship service, you're hearing a message, you're listening to a song, we're taking time to pray, and suddenly a tear rolls down your face, and you're going, whoa, what's happening here? Where'd that come from? And something awakens inside of you, and you realize the light's been flipped on. So Molino's had this experience and, and he called it a journey. It was a journey out of, out of his religious thought process and into a place in aware, of an awareness of love. And he said that there are four aspects to this journey that he discovered. And, and once that journey was complete, it was repeated over and over and over again throughout the course of his life. And he started seeing a pattern and every time it was repeated, there were two aspects of his spiritual life that would grow stronger. So I want to go through those with you tonight because I think they're really fun to go through and I think they're true. You can back them up with scripture. The first was what he called illumination. Illumination. Uh, th this point of falling in love. How many of you guys remember when, when Christ became real to you and the Holy Spirit of God just became real? It's like some people describe it like it was like somebody reached inside and flipped the light switch on and suddenly it's there. For others, it's more like a dimmer. You know, slightly eking up until one day you realize, oh, I was blind. Now I see. I just don't exactly know when that happened. I just, it just came on for me somehow. Um, what happened is that we experience, and I can testify this in my own life, we experience a revelation of the goodness of the grace of God. And in the middle of it, we, we experience our in, inability to save ourselves, to enlighten ourselves, to, to, to even educate ourselves about God. There's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And uh, I like listening to people talk about the Lord. But you know who I like to listen to the most? Is, is I want to hear from somebody who's his friend. And that's the thing I, I loved about Michael Reed is he had developed a friendship with God. What's what I love about my dad? He developed a friendship with God. And, and if you hang out with people who are a friend of God and they know it, you might get an introduction. It becomes real to you. It's really hard to lead people to Christ when all you're preaching is a concept. I figured that out as a young man. And I realized, though, when he becomes your friend, when you know he's your father, and when you're connected in heart, you want other people to love the people that you love. You want other people to love who you love. So introducing people to Jesus is no big deal. People say it to me all the time. I know, Bill, you say Bill, Jesus is a God of love and, and God is a God of love, but there's so much pain and suffering in the world, so I don't believe in God. And people will disprove the existence of God because of pain and suffering. They understand pain and suffering do not disprove the existence of God. 
Pain and suffering only disprove the existence of a God that does not allow for pain and suffering. Did I say that again? Yes. Pain and suffering only disprove the existence of a God who does not allow for pain and suffering. That's not the God we serve. God actually promises there will be pain and suffering in this world. But he says this, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, take heart. I have overcome the world. In other words, the promise of pain and suffering means that there's a lot of op options open to us, and they're both good and bad. God does not eliminate all of our bad options and leave us only with good options. That would not give us the capacity to necessarily experience love, because love is what you experience in the midst of a world filled with both good and bad, and in the midst of it all, you make lousy choices, and somebody shows up and extends grace to you anyway. And we have a God who sees us at our darkness and he loves us still. And if we had no, no capacity to experience pain, suffering, blindness, darkness, all of those things that come with that, we would never truly know how loved we actually are by a God who can like look beyond our transgressions, look beyond the, the, the frailties of our, our sin and the mess ups that we, we have, have no capacity to clean up on our own and still reach into our lives with grace and say, you're still mine. It's actually those moments that unveil to us the power of love and, and the power of redemption. And it's a beautiful thing. I believe God has, and you've heard me say this many times, but you'll hear me say this as long as you ever know me or allow me to speak into your life, but I believe God's power has the ability to reach into every moment of pain and loss and betrayal and suffering that you've ever experienced and will redeem it. And ultimately, the promise of God is not that we stand, uh, you know, having never experienced any suffering. The promise of God is that we stand having experienced a lot of baggage in this world and in this life and knowing that he's absolutely good, thoroughly victorious, and redeemed every moment of loss that we've ever, ever, ever had. Uh, why do we know this? Well, Revelation tells us that he'll wipe away every tear from your eye. There'll be no more pain, death, suffering. All of those things that ever caused any of those things in your life will be as though they never were something about the power of redemption, I believe that has the ability to erase every scar on your skin and on your soul and on your spirit and on your mind awesome. to the point where you know, we can't even put language to the goodness of how good he is. Eye hasn't conceived, ear hasn't heard, the, the, eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. It's not just that if you love him, you'll get to see this. It's that we only love him because he first loved us. And you don't get a revelation of how to love anything or anybody apart from a revelation of how loved you are by God. If we try to love apart from God, we're only making up what we think love is. And how many of you know you try that a bunch and it causes a ton of problems, it causes a ton of pain, it causes tons of heartache. And God's love has only ever caused heartache to himself. God's love took him to a cross on our behalf even when we didn't care. Even we heard the message and it didn't move us at all. It doesn't change the fact that he did and would do it again. And, and that God sacrifices himself on our behalf to redeem us back to him. It's the ultimate act of love. But you know the crazy thing is he continues to do so. I'm not saying that Jesus continues to be crucified. But the crucifixion that happened once for all happens continually in a sense that the power of the crucifixion 2,000 years later, the power of the shed blood of Christ has not uh, weakened with age. It's as if it's happening right now for you. In other words, you cannot out -sin the grace of God. You can't, you can't mess yourself up faster than he can clean you up. It's moments, it's words like this that suddenly awaken you to this awareness. It's, it's revelations from the scripture of how deeply we're loved by God that awaken us to an awareness of what I call, boom, we're illuminated, the lights go on. We go from darkness to light. Psalm 119, 130 says, the entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. In other words, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out the gospel. Jesus loves you, just leave it at that, it'll be just fine. Rest in that, believe that. The second is this, what he called being inflamed with love. He actually uses a word translated inebriated. Fascinating. In other words, he's illuminated to the reality of the love of God, and since his, 
His mind and his heart are now moved off of just religious ritual to try to be accepted by God. He came to the realization that he was already accepted by God, and based upon the fact that he was already accepted by God, suddenly he decides he's going to just focus in on the love of God. When he did, he discovered this very beautiful reality that the Bible says, that it says uh, Hebrews 12, 28, 29 says, therefore, since we've received the kingdom which can't be shaken, let us show gratitude or thanksgiving with which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and offer our God is a consuming fire. The inflamed love of God. It's, 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 It's when everything that you thought you were that made you unworthy is like wood that encounters a flame. And when that happens, the flame always wins. It's almost as if God's consuming fire is his love for us. The Bible says of God that he is a couple of things. He is a consuming fire and he is love. And the consuming fire of his love touches your life. You're never the same again. As a matter of fact, you may burn with the same passion for God, uh, maybe a sliver of the same passion for God that he has for you. And you start focusing in on the love of God. And what Molinos found was that it's intoxicating, actually, inebriating. And he would speak of losing track of time and space and just kind of wandering around in this bliss-filled euphoria. Interesting, isn't it? Fascinating. In Acts chapter two, by the way, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church, and uh, they spoke in tongues, there was a sound of rushing mighty wind, and, and, uh, uh, and, and tongues of fire fell on their head, and like everybody's head looks like it catches on fire, which is what I think happened, because they all run outside, and you know, if I look over at Tracy and her head's on fire, and then she looks at me and my head's on fire, we're running outside. We're just, you know, if we're inside, we're going out. And that's exactly what they did. They, they spill out of this upper room, and they look over, and they see what appears to be tongues of fire flaking off everybody, like that. Amazing moment. And, and you know what it says when the city came together, because they saw this radical group of people, because of the sound of the wind that happened in that moment, the city is entirely aware of the presence of God, and they show up to see what's going on. And you know what their first impression of the, their early church was? They were hammered drunk. Peter actually has to stand up and say, hey, hey, heads up, these folks aren't drunk like you think they are. What had just happened? They had just gotten a revelation that went beyond words of the goodness and the love and the power and the grace of God. And they wanted the entire world to know. They went out and turned the world, as the scripture said, upside down. So the first thing is illumination. Boom, light comes on. The second thing is when you get focused on the right thing, and that is the goodness, the grace, the love of God. You start reflecting it and you realize the fire of God takes over. The third is this, it comes from Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the words of Jesus, by the way, and this is where Michael realized that the fiery, passionate, molten, liquid love of God takes you is to a place of rest. In other words, it's not where the passion dies down. It's that you carry that passion, but you are in this consistent state of peace. You've heard me say this many times, and again, something I like to repeat often because I would love for you to repeat it any chance you get in any conversation you have. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of a person, Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. And when he dwells in you, the atmosphere within you is more powerful than the circumstances around you so that you find yourself in a place of peace even though everything around you is filled with turmoil. When you speak from within, because the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Bible says let the peace of Christ rule and reign in your heart. In other words, the person of peace, of Christ himself, sit on the throne of your heart. That's why I say all the time, no distance and no separation between you and him. None, zero. Well, what about my sin? 2 Corinthians 5 says he's not counting your sins against you, so you don't have an excuse of building a wall of sin between you and God. He breaks through, transcends, goes around it, makes it as if it's not even there, takes residence up in you, and you and I, out of the abundance of that heart where the Prince of Peace dwells, 
can release, and this is a huge one, ready? You can release declarations that release an atmosphere of peace into those circumstances so that you're not subject to just leave things the way they are. God sends us out into a world that's lost and hurting and filled with turmoil to do what? To literally release the peace of heaven into the atmosphere. Through the words we say, through the actions we take, through just, the, just, just being at peace. Have you ever been around somebody who carries the peace of God and they don't even have to say a word you can tell? We got friends like that. Amen. Uh-huh, we got friends like that. I love to have them come over to the house. They just sit on the couch and the atmosphere of the house was peaceful before, now it's super peaceful. Why? Because they know who they are, they know who they carry, and they, and they release them everywhere they go because of the words that they say. You don't have to be afraid around these people, they're just releasing peace everywhere. And when you're around them, you feel, feel filled up. On the other hand, have you ever, you ever been around spiritual vampires? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I, just, I made that term up, brand new, never said that before. I was talking about, I'm talking about the idea of you can get around people and you walk away and you're just like, oh my gosh, that was draining. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's something though about who you are called to be that is meant to impact and, and be a living invitation into the rest, the peace, the illuminating love of God for those people who can't ever quite get enough and so they take from you. Anyway. We shouldn't run from those people. We should run to them, embrace them until they chill out. Calm down. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, come unto me, all you who are, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The yoke... Um, is, is, uh, it's an, and this is an important note, if you're, if you're taking notes in your Bible at all, or if you're taking notes tonight. The, the word yoke is not necessarily meaning being tied to an ox or, or things like that, I, although that's nice. I mean, I, you get the idea that he pulls the load and we're just kind of along for the ride. Um, that, that's, that's a common analogy that's used. But the word yoke here, especially what, the way Jesus is mentioning it, the yoke was the teachings of the rabbi of his day. The teachings of the rabbi, uh, by the time Jesus showed up, the teachings of the rabbis were heavy and burdensome and nobody could do it. So when Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary, we're saying you're wearied by the religious system that's absolutely crushing you is what he's saying. Come unto you, all who are weary and heavy laden, somebody was putting a load on them, right? I'll give you rest. Take my teaching, my yoke. Take my teaching on you and learn. That's why he says learn from me because he's talking about his teaching. Take my teaching on you and learn from me. Hey, listen, I'm meek. In other words, I have strength under control. I'm lowly of heart. I'm gentle of heart. I'm not gonna be overbearing and steamroll you with a bunch of rules here. You and I are gonna to get to be friends. No matter how young or old, or how smart or how simple you happen to be, we can, we can have a relationship. I'm meek and lowly at heart. You'll find rest for your souls. He says, my teaching is easy. My burden is light. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Fourth was this, the fourth part of the path. Whew, gotta to come to an end here. Fourth is an inward filling of the power of the Lord. In other words, he became aware of the power of God. It's, now this is super, super important. It's one thing to be illuminated to the love of God. It's another thing to be consumed with the fiery passion of the love of God. It's yet another thing to find yourself at a place of rest where you find that you have the ability to release the love of God around you. It's entirely another thing when you encounter an obstacle that has the label of impossible, and you realize that you're not without power. You have now been given by God, entrusted with the capacity to do something about the impossibilities that you come in contact with. Luke 9 and Matthew 10 tell the story of Jesus saying to the disciples, behold, in other words, look, watch what I'm about to do. I give you power and authority. Then he tells them to go out and basically confront darkness, and they do, and the darkness is confronted, and disease leaves, and demons leave, and all kinds of stuff happens, and these guys are shocked when they come back, and they report that all this stuff has taken place. God, in Christ, had no problem giving power and authority 
the people who didn't know their right from their left. They didn't know who Jesus was. They, they hadn't accepted him really yet because they're still kind of like touch and go. He hadn't died for their sins. There was really nothing to accept. They're just following him and just doing what he says. Essentially, by definition, they're not really believers because he hasn't really given them anything to believe in except to watch what he does and do what he does. This is the essence of what it truly means to be a believer, and that is to be so connected to his voice that when he invites us to do something that causes us to step toward an impossible situation, that we do so just because he said it. I think that's one of the beautiful things about what's happening around here is we have people increasingly stepping toward impossible situations, not running away from them, and, and, and we're seeing cool miracles happen. <coughs> All right. <clears throat> The power of God. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And because of that, you will be my witnesses. In other words, you have to have a relationship to be a witness. As up on that one, you have to have been there, you have to have been around, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, even the othermost part of the earth. Does there happen to be a bottle of water, a glass of water up here? <coughs> Behind me. No. <laughs> Judy, amazing. Thank you. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 46, you there? I told you like an hour ago. Anyway, <laughs> going long tonight. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change or be moved, and though the mountains would fall into the sea. The waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Thank you. <clears throat> God is, first one, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It doesn't say that God takes all the trouble away, for if he did, there would be no need for him to be our refuge and strength. He is everything we need for every obstacle that we face, whether it's a sickness, a sin, a disease, no matter what it happens to be, he's everything we need him to be. <clears throat> Two things that Molino said that he would get, he got from this repetition of this journey, first thing he found was the strength to endure. The strength to endure, and he did. And you're talking about a guy who's been thrown in jail unjustly, and he's never gonna be heard from again, and he has lived his entire life's Existence going toward this thing of the consuming fiery passion of the intoxicating love of God and he is convinced that God is absolutely good but how good does God seem when he's isolated in a jail cell unable to be able to preach the gospel thinking of himself I want to be forgotten to history well here in 2020 a small group of people in Celebration Florida tonight are hearing his name and perhaps being inspired by his life I think that's kind of cool <clears throat> so, the second was that he developed from this consistent repetition of journey an increasing hope, and he literally called it an assurance that though, try as we might, you can't lose God. He's kind of fast, and he's a lot stronger than you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I put a post online today. Just kind of inspired by the thoughts I was going to share this evening that basically said, if the foundation of our faith is in a book, it can be argued out of your hands. If the foundation of our faith is in a doctrine, it can be uh, uh, taken away from you, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, can be debated away from you, disproven out of your hands. If the foundation of our faith is in a leader, can be offended out of your hands. But when your foundation is in Christ, your hands are like this. They're open because you are at rest, because it's not what's in your hand, it's that you're in his, and his grip is really strong. That's the foundation of our faith, is in the all-consuming fire of the love of Christ alone. God is our refuge, and God is our strength a very present help in trouble. You say, well, Bill, okay, so, so this journey and this journey into love, that, that's great. I'm gonna keep that in the back, back pocket until I need it someday. <clears throat> and you know, I've run into a lot of believers, and I've been there before, where Jesus is like your spare tire in your car. 
spare tire Jesus, right? Where you only, you only acknowledge that he's there when you need him. In other words, you have a flat, something goes wrong in life, boom, go to the spare tire. Medicine in the medicine, medicine Jesus, spare tire Jesus. You don't acknowledge him when things are going great, you only pay attention to him when things are going bad. And here's the thing about the way Molino's talked that I think is so inspiring, and that is he developed this lifestyle when he didn't need it. So that when he's in a jail cell and he did need it, he didn't relent, he didn't give up. And I think that's the call for all of us to be disciples that consistently pursue, passionately pursue going after an increasing, ever increasing revelation of the love of God. I would take that Psalm we just read tonight, Psalm 46, God is my refuge and my strength. I would pray that psalm over your life. Take the next week or so, and when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, pray that prayer and put a personal pronoun in there. God is my refuge. God is Bill's refuge and Bill's strength. Pray it over your children. God is, pray it over your spouse. God is Tracy's refuge and God is Tracy's strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, because of this, as a result of that revelation, I will give no place to fear, no matter what is going on in the earth, whether it's, whether it's earthquakes in Puerto Rico, whether it's fires in Australia, whether it's war with Iran. I will not fear, though the earth be removed, though mountains start falling into the sea. That's huge. How do we keep from fear of the things that are going on in the world? We realize that God is our strength. God is our refuge. God is a very present help in trouble. And if you think that God just purely does this on principle, you have no problem walking away from faith. But when you recognize that what God's doing in putting his love on display to us is purely because he loves, then you find yourself consumed with the fiery, passionate love of a God who loved us first. Not too bad on history tonight, huh? Bow your heads with me this evening. We're gonna just take some time and finish up with worship here this evening. It's a good way to finish up. And I'm gonna invite you tonight to invite the love of God to invade your heart. I'm gonna invite you to pray a prayer with me tonight just to invite the love of the Lord to invade your heart. And, uh, and if you've never been introduced to Jesus, well, this is a good night to get to know him. He's the dearest friend, the kindest friend I've ever known. I'm gonna invite us all with one voice just to pray this prayer together and from your heart, if you say, Bill, I need that kind of love and I need that relationship with the Lord in my life. I'm gonna invite you to pray with me with everyone tonight. Would you say this, Lord Jesus, I receive your love, a fresh revelation of an eternal love. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me of all of my sins and for loving me beyond all I can imagine. Now ignite that fire of love in my heart and let others feel it in me. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and for your love. Let's just take a moment, just a quiet personal moment, just to meditate on the love of the Lord tonight. for the Lord and worship. Let's finish this night with, with a song.